Welcome everybody to this talk, How Does the Internet Work? And our speaker is Peter Stugen. I'm very happy that he's here to explain to all of us how the infrastructure of the Internet really works. I'm pretty sure we will all learn a lot today. Please give a big and warm round of applause for Peter Stugen. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. This is an amazing translation of, into French. Wow. So uh, I want to talk about how the internet works and I try to uh, try to yeah try to shine some light on all the technologies that are involved when we use the internet every day. So why this talk? Some motivation first, then a little bit of brief background, just how the internet got started. And then we get into the details. So what actually happens between the web browser and the website? That's, that's the st starting point. So in the description, I, uh, I listed things from bottom up, so from the very low level packet stuff and through the various layers of the network stack up into the applications. And that's the building blocks part. But I inserted this, um, this overview first, what, what is actually going on between the browser and the website, because that's what most people already know and, and use a lot. Uh, some, some parts, um, well, some details about the different protocols. And uh, in the end, some recommendations for further talks if you find these, these topics interesting. So the, the reason I want to give this talk is to, to talk about how does the internet work, right? The, the mechanism that we use all the time, but aren't mentioned very much. So they, they are sort of obscured or, or, well, I don't know if hidden is the right word, but we, we, we don't experience the network itself very much, right? We experience the various services that we use, and they, the, the services, they try their hardest to, to keep us interested, to, to um, fancy, tickle our, our imagination. And I think, I think it's dangerous to not talk a little bit about the network every now and then, and to think about the network and to actually fight for uh, a public network that is available to all and, and equal, also neutral. If we, if we focus on the service providers alone, then they're going to be deciding what we can do with the network. But the point of, or, or the great thing about how the internet is neutral today is that we are all connected, or we could all connect to each other. We don't really have to use these service providers. Uh, we tend to. This is somehow a human nature to, to sort of go towards centralization and monopolization. But the internet is a tool that would allow us to try more, uh, more variants or, or other, other kinds of structures. And, we need, to, we need to be aware of that and uh, the importance of net neutrality. If we don't talk a bit about the network, we might lose it. So, how did it all get started? In um, 1970, uh, then ARPA, they started the ARPA net. So, uh, ARPA back then is, is now DARPA, that's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, they developed technology for the US military, and they did back then as well. So the ARPANET was, as, as the quote says from this very, very old document, um, that the objective is to get all their suppliers connected into a network together and, and being able to exchange information so that they can, I guess, make progress more, more quickly, more efficiently. Right, um, now it's something else. I think that's good. So let's, let's look at what happens between the browser and, and the website. So we have a person using a laptop, and they have a browser, and they, they type in a web address, events, cccde, for example, to, to read the blog post, um, the latest blog post about Congress. 
So then the browser really does two different things, first of all, uh, or, or to get to, to, to show this page. So first of all, it has to ask for uh, the, the way to reach this website that we want to reach. Computers, they don't, they don't deal very well with names or text, um, at least not network the network part of computers or, or systems. So there's this translation, um, somehow like a phone book, I'll get back to that in a bit, uh, called DNS, which is used primarily, it's, it has a few other uses as well, but it's used primarily to, to get from this name that we entered, events CCCDE, that we can also somehow easily remember, to the, the network address, the IP address of this website. So that's part one. And it says system DNS because the browser doesn't do all of this uh, phone book lookup itself. It can rely on the operating system to take care of this, uh, fortunately. So that's uh, the parentheses. That's what the operating system is doing. It's using a few protocols, UDP, IP, and that becomes a network packet. We'll get back to those in, in just a little bit. So once the browser has the, the network address, the IP address of this website, it uh, it creates a connection, so it contacts the, the web server, and uh, it uses this um, this set of protocols. So it first uses IP to to reach the IP address of the server, and then in particular it uses TCP for this connection type. We'll get back to those in a little bit as well. Uh, what what their properties are, and on top of that, the browser then uses the HTTP protocol. We'll see an, an example of that in the very end how or, or to to get to request the the, the, the web page that we wanted to see and um, that's all happening on the laptop in the browser and part in the operating system that we're using whatever that might be then there's uh, of course this long chain or or sometimes not so long but usually several several machines along the way routers we might have a wireless router at home or in a coffee shop or here at, at Congress. Uh, and beyond that, there, is certainly, uh, there are certainly some more routers along the way from or between our laptop, my laptop, and the, the destination that I want to contact. So all of these routers, they, they receive some, some packet. They look at the, the addresses where it's going in particular and then sends it along its way, so they're they're just forwarding packets all all day long. Finally, at the destination on the on the web server, there are also two two parts. So first of all, the 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 request that was sent by the um, by the browser is received. It goes through these these different uh, different layers, these different protocols. And the website server software, it, it looks at the request and it sees, OK, somebody wanted the, the first blog post. Then I'll send that right back the same way that I received the request. And that's part two, so returning the response to this request. And it goes all the way through the, the routers, the same, like, the same path, but in the reverse direction to the laptop. So let's, let's look at all these. Uh, these different building blocks, all right? So let's start with the small, smallest one, the network packet. I've talked about packets going back and forth. So uh, the packet or a packet is, is sort of the, the atom on the network. It's the smallest useful unit that is sent or processed by the network. I, I think a good way to explain packets is with uh, regular postcards that we can send with mail because um, their size, their maximum allowed size is, is pretty much standardized. It's, it's, you, can't, you can't send a postcard which is one meter, right? And it's the same with the network packets. You can't send arbitrarily large network packets. One pretty common maximum size is um, 1,500. Uh, bytes or roughly characters. So just to give an idea of of how fairly small the packets are actually, and even that might 
I don't know, do 1,500 characters fit on a postcard? No, I guess not. I think that's too much. So maybe the packets are a little bit larger than postcards, but, but still the, the analogy is, is pretty good because you send them out and, and there's very little... Um, there's a little bit of structure, like there's a stamp perhaps and a, a recipient address, but that's pretty much it. So what you, what you write on the postcard on the on the other side is really up to you, and it's the same with the packets. They can contain anything, but if you write in a language that the receiver doesn't know, then they're going to receive the packet and then actually just drop it because they don't know what you're trying to tell them. So packets, they are sent and received through network interfaces. This is um, um, an Ethernet cable LAN port or a, a Wi-Fi antenna or maybe a 3G, 3G modem if you're um, on, on the go, out and about. And your cell phone does this, of course, as well, right? The cell phone has, has Wi-Fi if you're in a coffee shop maybe or it has 3G if you're uh, in the subway or on the tram. And one interesting thing or where the comparison to the postcards doesn't really really fit anymore is that network interfaces they can they can easily pass millions of packets in a single second so it can be can be quite a lot of information going going through especially if you have a good internet connection like here at congress so then the next next step or sort of if you start looking at okay what can we put on the uh, on the information side of the postcard, right, where where we can put any message we want. Uh, for for this talk, I'm only going to focus on IP version four. I know it's it's old and and legacy, and we really shouldn't be using it still. But it is, um, it's 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 dominant so far. It won't be forever, but so far it's it's quite common, and I think it's. Uh, it's something that most of us have at least seen when setting up the Wi-Fi or, or the new internet connection, right? This, this IP address that I put up on the slide is, is maybe the most common IP address there is, right, for the, for the new wireless router. These, these IP addresses, they are, consist of the four numbers, and they are the four numbers, they range from zero to 255, and then there's yeah, four of them, and with dots in between is just how we write them. This is an efficient way for, for machines to identify themselves, but um, the reason IP version 4 isn't so great anymore is that it's, it's quite, quite a small number of addresses. So it turns out that the internet is, is pretty popular, and worldwide the addresses are have run out or are running out there's 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 there aren't enough addresses for all the devices that are actually participating or somehow connected to the internet ipv6 will solve this let's see maybe maybe we'll live to to experience that um, so what is what is a network then there are different kinds of networks. I've written physical networks and, and logical or abstract networks. Physical network is cabling, right? Um, if you have some kind of connection from your internet service provider, it goes to your, your wireless router, and um, you have a, or if you have a LAN set up like in the hack center, uh, with a sw switch and lots of cabling uh, cables to each one cable to each computer that's a physical network and uh, that's a tangible thing right that's something we can we can touch and we can modify with our hands and, and so on but then there are also and that's that's one certainly one network type and another equally valid network type is the logical network or as i also call it the abstract network which is defined only by the addresses used by some set of computers that are communicating together. So here's an, an example of an IP network that might be used with the wireless router that that's, has the, the IP address up on top, right? And uh, the, there's sort of a pattern, right? The first three digits are the same, uh, and that's the address, the, the network address, and the very last part is, is, is uh, zero. 
with the slash 24, uh, meaning the 24 first bits of the 32, so now it's, it's technical maths and binary and sorry. Uh, but essentially the, f the 24 means the first three numbers are always the same. And within this logical network, so within this group of computers or systems that can communicate with each other, uh, only the very last digit will, will change. And as long as this is, um, this is the case, we don't need a router yet. We can, all these computers or all these systems, they can communicate directly with each other on the local network uh, or on a Wi-Fi or, or whatever. And the slash 24 and with the 255, 255, 2550, that's just two different ways to express exactly the same thing. So where do these, these IP, address, uh, IP addresses come from and, and how, who has them and, and so on? So if we, if we get a wireless router, then, uh, then we have some IP addresses, but uh, me and my friend, we both have the same, perhaps, IP addresses because we have a wireless router from the same supplier, right? And this is a little bit of a special case. Those aren't internet IP addresses. They're used only, uh, only very locally. So only in, in one home network, only in one company network, perhaps. The, the, the public IP addresses are the ones that um, are on the outside of this, uh, this wireless router that I got. And the wireless router typically only has one. Some, some internet providers give you a few but it's very easy to have a lot more devices in your home or in your office than public IP addresses that you get from your internet, internet provider. So the IP addresses, they're assigned to the internet providers and, um, or the other way around, I, um, internet providers, they apply for some, some range of some, some number of IP addresses. And here in Europe, um, there's an organization called RIPE um, in charge of allocating a block of IP addresses to the internet companies that um, are, are actively connecting to other internet companies and, and maybe are also your internet providers and, and mine. So, and, and RIPE, they have, uh, they of course have uh, colleagues in, uh, in, in different parts of the world, so I think they're four or five, maybe even six of, of the RIPE organizations, the regional network centers. They assign IP address blocks to the internet uh, companies. And by internet company, I don't only mean internet providers that, that we use at home and, and at work, but also um, really any larger company that has a service available on the internet. So all the streaming sites that you can imagine, all the most, well, several large just websites that are used every day will also have their own IP address range and will be active in uh, finding different ways to connect to the internet providers so that the end users can have a, 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 as good an experience as possible when they're uh, visiting their or using their services. So I talked about the internet companies, they are trying to find good ways to, uh, to, to connect to each other or to make it possible for users on one, at, with one internet company to reach either users uh, at another internet company or uh, some service provided by, by some internet company. And that's, uh, that's the routing that's going on both in the wireless, wireless router at home, but uh, just as well and, and even more so in, in all these routers on the internet that are uh, handing packets back and forth. So starting with the wireless home router, it, uh, it typically has one local um, network, at least it might have more. So I, I had a home router that uh, had both the, the regular Wi-Fi network and I was also able to configure a guest, guest network or a guest password. So that's actually two... It's Wi-Fi, so it's not really so intuitive, but those are two separate physical networks because if you're connected to one, you can't communicate directly with the other network. 
without a router. Now there's, um, there's some chance that the wireless router will do this, will enable this communication, but it's not for sure, and it's not, it's not certain. And in fact, it's more likely that it won't work because this guest access, you're supposed to be able to give that to somebody who's just visiting, and maybe you don't want them to access your, your printer or your, your um, storage uh, uh, cabinet or, or whatever, right? So it's quite likely that this guest, guest network doesn't get access to the main network. So two different networks, uh, even though it's, it's the, same, um, the same radio waves or the same air that's carrying the radio waves. But the, the, the key, key property by the, or with a wireless or a home router is that it almost always only has a single internet connection. So it has a single connection to some internet uh, provider or in, in the direction of the internet. Typically, that's, that's the, the telco, uh, but in some cases, there's even, especially in the US, there's uh, um, the situation where the telco or the internet provider is also um, an, a content service provider, and that's, that's a pretty bad situation, uh, in particular if you have no options, no choice. So we have the home router with a single connection towards the internet, um, to the internet provider. Let's compare that with the internet routers that are um, further out on the internet and operated by the many different internet, internet companies. They, they will similarly have one or more local networks that, that belong to them, uh, the same way that the wireless network belongs to the, the home router. Uh, a wireless wireless company, or uh, sorry, an internet company or an internet organization, let's say like the CCC as well, uh, has some some equipment, some servers with the, the events. Uh, CCC DE server, for example, is is part of the CCC slice of the internet, and um, the router that's that's responsible uh, for for all of um, CCC's um, networks. Has like is 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 responsible for also this this IP segment where the web server is. Now the the big difference here is that those internet routers or the the routers that are further out on the internet than our home routers, they typically connect to at least two, but usually many more other internet routers. Uh, exactly how is is different in every location. Uh, there are some, some norms and some, some common topologies, but uh, this is... Um, so the connections that exist are determined by, uh, by peering agreements between the, the internet companies and their uh, internet organizations. They can, of course, have agreements with whoever, so it's, it's not so easy to tell um, beforehand what a particular organization, how a particular organization will do peering. This is an interesting topic. There are some more talks on, on this as well uh, that I'm referring to later. Uh, one, at least one model is to have uh, a site, uh, some, some data center somewhere, uh, where an internet exchange is running. So this is an organization whose sole purpose is to enable many different internet, um, internet companies or internet organizations to somehow make their way there, put some cables to this, this data center and all connect together and be able to exchange traffic between each other efficiently and um, maybe even at no cost. So that's, that's a, uh, an interesting interesting uh, topic because there are so many different business models for, for this peering, uh, for the peering agreements. So the internet exchange is, is one, uh, one model. There's, there's a handful of them in, in Germany and yeah, that's, that's about the scale of it. Um, private peering is of course possible too, where organizations just have a direct connection between, between each other. And, okay, so these connections, they are then established somehow, and 
how, to, how do the routers know where to send what? And that's a, that's a good question. Uh, this is managed by routing protocols. BGP is, is, is one, one such application, or uh, some, uh, a bird is, is one application, and then BGP is the protocol. So uh, there's, there are some rules. You can configure what to prefer, what, um, what route to prefer, but you can also just say, I don't really care so much, and just use whatever is available. And of course, this depends on how much you have to pay for traffic that you send which way. If you have a really good peering agreement with um, uh, another internet organization and you're, uh, you're able to send a lot of traffic their way, then uh, without having to pay very much extra or maybe anything at all, then of course you're going to try to send as much traffic as possible that, that way. All right, so now we're getting uh, we've, we've looked at IP addresses, and IP addresses, uh, we know some, some systems on the internet or connected to the internet, all, of, all systems connected to the internet, they have some IP address. And if we know the IP address, we can try to, try to reach that system. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a bit unfortunate. So the, the first... Um, uh, the first bullet point is uh, UDP. It's um, now we're talking about okay. So on the on the postcard when we're writing stuff there, we 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 put the IP address because we know what system we want to reach, but um, we want to send it some kind of message as well. Um, there are a few few different ways to to structure messages, and. These are the most common ones, or, or the ones that make up almost all of the, the traffic on the internet. So the first one is, is UDP. It's, it's quite like postcards. So it's just a single message. There's no, there's no context, there's no connection between two different messages. And there's also no guarantees about how this message will, or this packet will, will perform on the network. So, uh, if you send out a UDP packet, it, it might arrive or it might not, and you'll never know. And um, that can seem a bit useless, but actually it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite good in, in many cases. For example, if you're doing real-time uh, real audio or video streaming, UDP is a good choice because it's real-time information. So if something is missing, maybe there will be a, a glitch in the, in the audio or there will be some glitch in the, in the video, but yeah, that, it's not so important to wait and delay the, the image to fix that glitch. It's better to get the next image and just replace the image. So just keep, keep, on, keep on going. And for that, UDP is a, is a really good fit. Uh, it, it's just send it, send it along, and if it arrives, it arrives. Most of the time, it does arrive. Most of the time, it works fine. Uh, so sometimes a good choice. The next, uh, the next point there is TCP. So maybe you've heard the, the term TCP/IP, and TCP/IP is exactly the. So specifically, it's the combination of this, this TCP that I'll get into in, in a second with the IP addressing. Both TCP and UDP, they, uh, they have the concept of a port. So that's a second, uh, second address. You could compare that with, uh, uh, let's say, the, the IP address is the street name. And the port is the, 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 the number, the, the house number on that particular street. So it's a bit more precise. You know it's that system, but that system might have many, uh, might offer many services, and you want one specific one. So for each of the common services that we use, email and, and uh, web and uh, Jabber and whatever, there are typical, typical port numbers that are um, allocated and always the same, so that I don't have to guess or, or look up what it, what it is. So with TCP, what, what are the properties of that? That's, um, that's uh, more like a, a, a stream of um, uh, letters that you have to go to the post office and, and uh, uh, acknowledge that you've received. 
So the, the recipient of a TCP packet or a, a network packet with IP and TCP inside of it will always confirm reception to the sender. So this allows this concept of a connection that I mentioned, where both sides talking to each other are, uh, uh, are synchronized and know where the, the, the other party is in this communication or in this connection, what data has been received and what has not yet been received. So the, the packets, TCP packets, can of course also get lost. Right? There's, there's no guarantee with, uh, with any network that it will always function correctly. You can just pull the cable and it will not be possible to send any packets. So TCP will, will uh, recognize that, oh, so I sent some packets out, but they haven't been confirmed, they haven't been acknowledged. Um, okay, I'll, I'll try again. I'll send, send again a few times, and it's, it's usually adjustable how long uh, TCP will be retrying to communicate, and finally it will give up and say, yeah, sorry, that seems that this connection is broken. I, it's not possible to, to communicate anymore over this, uh, over this path. But if you're quick and you plug the cable back in, then maybe everything will, uh, will heal or the connection will just continue functioning just as if there was never an interruption because the, the, the network software is, is keeping track of what has been sent, what has been received and can recover from, uh, from this, this loss of communication. And the, the third one on the bottom is SCTP. This is um, not, not quite so widespread, but it's, uh, it's still a very powerful mix. It's, it's a lot younger than, than the other two. So UDP and TCP, they're uh, from the, I'd like to say 70s and 80s. Uh, yeah, so quite quite old. Whereas SCTP is, uh, I think the standard was was final in, or the first version of the standard came in 2000. So it's, it's quite a lot um, younger this this protocol. But it's a powerful um, combination of properties from the both uh, the, from the from the older ones. So you can have. Whereas TCP, you just have a, a constant stream of text, essentially, or, or image, or whatever content you're transferring. With UDP, you had this message that's on the postcard, like it's one postcard that you're sending, that's the fixed, fixed message. TCP doesn't have that concept, it's just, just information all the time until the connection closes. SCTP, you can have a connection concept where both sides are uh, aware of the, the communication status or the, the position in, in the communication, but you will be able to you still you will still be able to send messages like on the postcards or, or like the postcards. So you have a fixed fixed size piece of information that you want to transfer, and you can you can send that as a as a unit. Uh, whereas if you're only using TCP like we do on the web all the time, you have to build a lot of stuff around or on top uh, of TCP in order to achieve the same thing. So if I want to transfer an image or when my browser wants to download an image, there's quite a lot of extra work that has to go uh, into making that possible with the regular TCP protocol that, that is, is being used for now. So advantage, SCTP certainly, it also has um, the, the retry, the reliable delivery, if you, uh, if you want to. And you can also use multi-homing. So that's not so common yet. As I said, typically the wireless home routers, they only have a single internet connection. But that might change. We might in the future see several different kinds of internet connections that, that we're using. And SCTP would be able to take advantage of that quite easily, whereas the other ones cannot. Um, so SCTP can send the same information over several different connections, and whatever comes first, uh, arrives first at the destination, is, is accepted. This is 
of course a bit wasteful, but uh, in some cases maybe it's, it's not a problem. So that's, that's an exciting, I think, exciting new feature. Let's see what the, the, the future brings. It seems that, it seems that TCP is, is going away slowly, but surely, um, uh, let's see what happens. But the, the, some, uh, some, uh, some companies, they're providing systems where they want they want to control much more of how the the software is using the network, how the software is communicating on the network. And the way that these systems are built, cell phones typically or smartphones, it's not it's not so easy to to do that with uh, either TCP or SCTP, but it's quite easy to do it if they're using UDP. So I think that's a big motivator for them um, to to try to move away from TCP and, and use UDP even more. Let's see. Oh, sorry. So then we'll get into some applications. Now we've, uh, we've written on the postcard, we've written uh, addresses, IP addresses, uh, the system that we want to communicate with, and we've uh, chosen either UDP or, or TCP, uh, depending on what what is uh, most suitable actually it depends typically on the application so some applications require one or the other and a few applications can do either or the first thing i'd, I'd like to mention here is uh, dns I, I call it the phone book the internet phone book so but there's one big difference a phone book is, is something we get from from one publisher, right? The phone company, typically, and they or or the POC here at Congress, and they they've just collected or they know all the phone numbers and they they send us the list, right, with the names. DNS is is different in that everybody who has um, who has a, a a name in the DNS in the domain name system, so anybody can register a domain name. And anybody who does that can, can publish some information there. You can decide what you publish, actually. You can decide if you publish. Uh, so let's say you have uh, a thousand IP addresses. You can decide if you want to publish names for all of those thousand, or if you just uh, maybe publish a few of them that are going to be interesting for other people to use, and 90% and of them are just internal, uh, internal systems. So everybody gets to choose what they, what they publish and everybody can publish, also can, can run the infrastructure uh, storing this information on their own. So it's not that you have to send this in somewhere necessarily and they publish it for you, you can actually do that on your own. So it's decentralized, very good. Still, it's a super, super old protocol also from, from those days of from those early days of the internet, and nobody was thinking about security, and uh, nobody, uh, well, nobody had done a lot of uh, attacks on uh, whether it on on these protocols, whether it be reliability attacks or or just forgery attacks and and so on. That wasn't a concern because this was, remember, designed for. Uh, companies working for the government, right? So everybody was interested in collaborating and there were no bad actors. The internet now is, is again, quite different. So some of these, these old, well, most of these old protocols actually aren't, aren't so great anymore. Basic functionality of DNS or the phone book is to publish IP addresses, but you can publish other things as well. Um, if you're interested in, in DNS, there's a good, good talk about that later on, I'll, I'll mention in a bit. So the next application I want to talk about is, is SMTP, or the next application protocol, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. This is what is used to deliver every single email in the world uh, all the time, all day long. Now, one thing that's a bit, bit interesting, uh, or quite interesting, but also uh, problematic, I'd say, about email and, and not SMTP per se, perhaps, but 
the scope of SMTP is that SMTP is used only to send email. So SMTP doesn't have anything to do with receiving email. This means that there's a, so there's a separate, separate mechanism for receiving email. And the way these two, um, uh, these two different protocols or mechanisms work end up putting the cost of email with the person receiving mail. So I have to pay in order to, uh, either with information or with money, to get an email address where I have some, some gigabytes of storage. Whereas people sending email, they don't have to pay anything. They just need an internet access and then they can send all the email they want all day long to every single possible address, email address in the world. And that's why we have a spam problem on the internet. So th this is, um, yeah, it's a bug. I, I, yeah, let's see if this can get fixed. Email is so tightly integrated into our everyday lives that um, I'm not sure. Uh, but let's see, that would be great. So on the, the last one, uh, the last application protocol I want to mention is the um, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer, uh, Transfer Protocol, that's used for web, right? You recognize it from the, from the web browser. Uh, URLs. Web pages used to be just hypertext, so text with some links in them. That's all, all they could do in the very beginning. And I'd like to show an example of, of SMTP. Actually, this, I, I have to do something about this because it's not so, uh, it's not so easy to read. Let's see. Yeah. yeah, I should have done that already. Sorry about that. Um, so this is an, an example of an email delivery. Uh, this, is, this is all it takes to send an email on the internet. And the, the, the left and the right on the, on the edge there is, uh, so the arrow pointing that way. Right, left, is rece uh, received from the email server, so from the SMTP server, and the arrow pointing this way is what we send to the email server when we want to send an email. So if we connect to an email server, for example mine, it will say, uh, send us some text. We're using, uh, by the way, TCP, and we're using port 25 for, for SMTP. So we get a stream of text uh, going back and forth. The, the server tells us 220 and its name. That's uh, some kind of welcome code. We say, hello, I'm, I'm, my name is laptop, because I'm doing this for my laptop. The, the mail server says, OK, good to meet you. And then we say, I want to send an email where the sender address is test at stugib.se. And if you're paying attention here, the sender of the email gets to, gets to say what the sender address is. So this is why it's super easy for anyone to forge email from any sender address. It's, it's just it's part, part of the message, uh, or the part of the, 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 yeah, part of the message. Server accepts the sender, yeah, even though the sender might not even exist. I tell it, um, recipient, this is for me, mail for me. Send, uh, server says, OK. Then I say, here's the data for this, uh, for this email. And the server says, go on, start, start sending me the contents. And then I send, um, send an email where uh, the, the sender is trollololololol and just some fake fake sender address, uh, whatever subject, and some text. And in the end, uh, I've, I finish with a dot to, to say, OK, end of message. End of mail, the server says OK. And then I say to the server, I want to quit now. I don't want to talk to you anymore. The server says, closing, goodbye. And this, is, this is email on the network. 
last example. A web page access over HTTP. So this is even, even simpler. I've simplified this even a little bit more. If you try this, uh, try this yourself, please do. So HTTP is also TCP and uh, port 80. I tried um, talking to the events CCCDE web server, and I told it same thing here. Arrows pointing this way is, is what, what we send when we contact the server. So connection opens. I send get slash and HTTP 1.0 because I want to get the, the, the main page. And I'm saying I'm, I'm speaking HTTP version 1.0. 1. Uh, and then I tell it, OK, I want to access this start page on, on the host name events, CCCDE. And then I send it an empty, uh, empty line. That's to, to say, OK, this is my, my request. And then there comes the response, comes back with the arrows going in the other direction, where the web server says, uh, actually, so what you're asking for, it's not available uh, here where you're asking for it. You have to go somewhere else. It's a redirect. That's the, the 301 is the code for HTTP code for redirect. And this, this uh, contents that you're asking for, this page, it's been moved permanently. The new location is HTTPS events, CCCDE. So I was using a, an, an, an IP and TCP connection with no encryption. And um, that's why I can just type in uh, the, the, the get and the, the host line. But the web server tells me, yeah, sorry, I don't want to talk to you without encryption. So you have to go to this HTTPS address instead. Thank you. Event CCCDE. I like encryption. That's good. And thank you also to all the angels that make Congress possible, because without them and without you uh, who are here, who, who are angels, it, there wouldn't be any Congress. And also, I want to say a huge thank you to you in the audience for being curious and, and wanting to learn something new. Thank you very much, Peter. Now we have some time left for Q&A, so if you have questions, please do line up at the microphones that you find here, um, if you want to ask anything. Do we have a question from the internet? No, the internet is out of questions. Do I see anybody standing at any microphone? Please make yourself known if I overlook you. Any questions? Oh. At microphone five, please do ask your question. Yeah, you mentioned um, that you think SMTP um, has a kind of bug um, in the sense that um, the, you can just send an email and the responsibility is on the side of the receiver. Um, so if you call it a bug, it seems you have an easy solution. I'm sorry, but no, I, I don't. So there was, uh, <laughs> I mean, I wish that that would be great. It's not so easy to fix because because it's it it is a property of SMTP, right, uh, and and of the email system that we're using. So there was a proposal a long long time ago by somebody much smarter than me uh, called Internet Mail 2000, where where actually the whole thing is switched around so that the sender has to store the message and the receiver can go and pick it up. So there the cost is, is, is placed on the sender. And I think that would uh, go a long way to solving the spam problem, but it's also it's not compatible with the email software that we have today. So I don't, like, there's, it's not clear to me how we would be able to migrate uh, in, a, in, a, in a good way, unfortunately. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? That does not seem to be the case. So please give another warm round of applause to Peter Stuger. Thank you very much for the talk. Right. Thank you.